everybody doing this extra night i hope you have a, your libations it's a thursday so you get a pass if your libation is not non-alcoholic listen family we got to get into it we're going to get into this book we are not wasting any time any time whatsoever for anybody hit that like button for me you all know the drill i'm just going to try to get into it um because i want to try to bring in callers just a little bit earlier than usual on this call because i want to try to have a discussion i'm always trying to find ways to make this kind of to make this a, a better discussion and more fruitful um those of you who know know we we read the american slavery american freedom it was really something to get through i kind of teased about the, the 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 harvesting of the tobacco um and the genteel and wild american people of that time so one of the things that I want to kind of hit, like time we start, as we're going to jump right into this, just boom. One of the things I want to hit first are some themes that I saw throughout the book. The first thing that I think you have to take into context with this book, or any book we read, because we're all learning here together, is like when it was published or whatever. And this was like 75. And that's why I think there's a part in the book where... He says, well, it was rumored that Jefferson had an affair with Sally Hemings. Well, we're at a point where we want to, we, it ain't rumored no more. Like we know now. So there are definitely, when you look back at, you know, history, one of the things to kind of, that we kind of can and should take um, from all of this is that history is not a static, it is not a static enterprise. It is not a static thing. History is always moving. History is always going. And, and, and we're always learning new things about what happened. And I saw, um, there was a Twitter tr thread that I tried to find. I tried to find it before the show, but I saw it. And they were talking about some critiques of American slavery, American freedom. So what we should also be doing 
is is going to look at those as well and i think maybe that should be part of the book club as i think about it is that we kind of come back and we kind of revisit the books especially this is like i said 75 1975 we revisit it and say this is what we learned and this is what's different and this is what's new but having said that and the reason why i said that i just want to frame where this book is and where the mind was where the public mind was during that time frame um, in terms of Americanism and Americana. So if it seems that this book is somewhat conservative in terms of its views, I think you have to see it in that context as well. Um, and you have to see timing. And one of the things when we go through, I'm going to go, I'm going to hit parts of this book. And of course, if you call in, you are free to hit parts that I did not get to and make all of those other points. And I'm going to get to other, I'm going to get to the calls as soon as I can, you know, so that everybody, I know a lot of people like, I I wouldn't want to read this book either and not get to say nothing if I read it and I read it all the way through. I'm going to do a pop quiz. You're going to have to I need to know if you read it all the way through before you call. But no, I'm just playing. Listen, timing, wealth, how wealth is created, how we got locked out of wealth, wealth being used in terms of, in terms of these people and these white peasants and servants and all that stuff. All of this is kind of comes into play in this book and we always i think if, if there's one thing that this book does other than teach me about tobacco and farming and how the indians farm versus how the white people farmed and uh if it does one thing other than that it shows me that there is no there is no well slavery was something that happened it is it is a blemish on americana it is a blemish on what we are no slavery is what we are like we are here and it was very intentional and you did it to give white people and, and those peasants who came over a way of life. So let's get started, fam. If you, once we understand that slavery is not a mistake, we understand that our lack of wealth is not a mistake. So please, please take your book if you have it, if you read it. And please turn to page five for me. Because I want to read something that he said on page five that's really sorts of sets the stage for the whole book. So if you didn't read the book, this page five kind of sets the stage for how all of this goes, how all of it goes down. Listen to what he says. American reliance on slave labor must be viewed in the context of the American struggle for a separate and equal station among the, among the nations of the earth. At the time the colonists announced their claim to that station, they had neither the arms nor the ships to make that claim. They desperately needed the assistance of other countries, especially France and their single most valuable product, which, which to purchase assistance was tobacco. Produced mainly by slave labor. Now we're talking about 1600 America. We're talking about, a, we're talking about a colony. We're not even talking about a country at this point. This is a colony, England. And you, you, you have this, what he's basically saying is that this country is trying to figure this, this place, not a country yet, trying to figure its way through. And the way to make this country happen was slavery. That's the way to make it happen. He goes on to say, to a large degree, it may be said that Americans bought their independence with slave labor. Hold on. American bought their independence with slave labor. Do you know what that means? That means that this is a country because of slaves. So how is everybody going to tell me all the time? Well, no, you didn't create this country. You didn't slave. No, the independence of America was bought by having not having to pay your labor. And what that took off of white people, like what that took off of the white people who came here. They didn't have to be the bottom because you, you use slaves to make a new bottom. So they could say, yeah, I want to fight for this thing because this thing that I'm fighting for is freedom. It's not peasantry. It's not servitude. I am fighting for freedom and I am going to get freedom. So I, I'm all in. It's easy to be all in when you see yourself as being free. Let's keep it moving. Let's keep it pushing. On the same page though, Virginia was the largest of the new states in the territory, in, in, in territory, in population and influence and slaveholding. That means Virginia, we're talking about Virginia, 
1600s as a territory here under under the, the the old England rule or whatever. That's what we're talking about. That's how this all began. And England, even when we talked about, I mean, um, Virginia maintains importance throughout all of this history. So understand the importance of Virginia in terms of tobacco and in terms of slavery. Now let's move on, shall we, family, in the Breaking Blind Book Club and ADOS Book Club. Let's move on to page 16 really quick. Because I want to, we need to give everybody a mindset so that everybody doesn't keep thinking this is a mistake. Let's just give a mindset of what this meant to people in terms of what, what were they thinking when they just set out and sailed and they were going to do all this stuff. By adopting generous criteria of relevance, and we're talking about the people who settled here and all of that, he was able to present documents which imparted to the whole, to the whole book a powerful suggestion that Englishmen ought to rule the world that they had discovered. See, this is my problem. This is my problem with um, Morgan a little bit. He seems to like have, and again, it's 75, so I kind of expect it, but there seems to be a sort of deference to like the English people, even when they talk about the Native Americans as if like, well, he tried to do the right thing. It ain't work out. He wanted them to be partners, but they ended up being slaves. They didn't work hard enough as Native Americans. They like to kind of lay about. You know, there are, there are a few parts here where they talk about how the women of Native Americans did the majority of the work. And like the men were kind of, they didn't do much work. And even the Native American women did anywhere from three to six hours of work. And they liked that life. It seems like a pretty good life. It seems like the life that elite white people live now. So I don't see what problem they had with it. But I understand they were trying to build a new world. And so the Native Americans had set all this stuff up. And had, had they farming set up in a certain way. They got to move around. They were nomads. And not nomads because they didn't want to build homes. But nomads because, you know, why do that when the... the when our farming means that we got to move around. So let's just move around. If the farming says we're going to move, just move. Like if we got to move and, 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 and this soil gets, you know, whatever, and we got to move to a new part of soil, we just put up the teepees and we keep it pumping. Ain't nothing, there's nothing like uh, unevolved about that when your farming is that. But like, I think when you look at it, it looks like, well, like white people just kind of wanted people to work for them. And they felt like that they would be the they would be the shepherd of the savages or whatever so i think that morgan is very seems to me i'm not just i can't speak for anybody else and y'all can tell me when you call in he seemed a little more uh deferential to them than i would have been i don't i don't know and i would need to read more about it that they had any kind of um that they had any that i, I need to see the paperwork to show like they really intended on being great friends because they didn't end up being great friends so if you go to one of the parts of this, if you go to page, I think it's 23, it was the blueprint for utopia. Now go to the, page 23, it's like the second paragraph, the, the, the paragraph right before the big quote. It was a blueprint for utopia, benefactors living side by side with Indian beneficiaries, both enjoying new comforts in peace and prosperity with the cannibals expelled to some outer region. Child, what's going on? Now, see, this same thing, see, this, this, this same thing kind of crops up. Now, see, we're going to go all the way. We're going to go all the way back because I have to, what the, what the paper be still? I have to go all the way back to 236 just for one moment because this kind of pairs with something. Just hop around with me for a minute, please. Well, I, you know, I think I'll get to that in a second because I think it goes to how to, how to, how to, how to, how to Virginia, how to, end, how to, um, how the, the, the people who, remember they call these white people who they sent to Virginia, the scum of, 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 of England. They said these people didn't want to work and some of them were convicts and they had all kinds of problems and they had to get out of here because we ain't got enough jobs. That's how y'all came to America anyway. And so you get to like who they were and the malfunction and all of that sort of thing. But let's just, let's just, let me just go here for a second. England had more people than jobs. That's on page, thir page 31. And you see more of that on page 235 to 236. But one of the things that was very interesting to me, even when you went to England, one of the things that happened is that they had a lot of these things called workhouses. I was like, what you mean? It was a work. I've heard of that before and I've read it before because it was in the Denmark Vesey book. And it was in a few other books about how, listen, it seems that the Western world has always had this thing where if you don't want to work, 
or if you are not working hard enough, or if you don't want to work for starvation wages, we are going to put you in something called a workhouse. And a workhouse, even like John Locke said, you could be in a workhouse at like three, four, seven years old. Like, get the baby in there. Get the baby in there. They can pick cotton with their little paw hands. And there was this belief that the best, like, there was this belief that regular people, poor people, were just kind of, had decided that they were not going to work. Meanwhile, you were just working. You were living the life of everything. You were living a wonderful life. But these poor people had just kind of decided that they were not going to work. And the best way to get them to work, and this gave me chills, the best way to get them to work was through putting them, was through incarceration. So they don't want to work. We'll take them somewhere early on and teach them how to work and make them work. And then they'll be valuable to society because, and you can only, and even if they're outside of jail, you can only pay them slave, slave wages. You can only pay them slave wages because if you do any, if you give them other, anything above what is necessary for food, they'll spend it on alcohol or something. I mean, this just, for me, for me, this goes all the way back to not just mass incarceration, it goes back to Uber, Right? So I'm going to give you, I'm not going to really give you enough to take care of the car. You're going to have to struggle. You're going to have to do all that stuff. And if I gave you more than that, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be running around at midnight trying to find somebody to pick up. So in order for me to keep you hungry, I have to do that. That's kind of what I see in this book. And even if we go to, go to page 44 for me, fam. Because we talk about the, and this, the title of chapter three is really something. Because I say, I say Indian right now because that's what he's saying. I say Native American normally, but that's what he's saying. I can't get it mixed up. I'm just trying to stay with the book right now. 75. Idle Indian and lazy Englishman. Isn't that something? Roanoke dispels some illusions both among the Indians and among the English. The Indians of the Virginia region would not likely again to mistake the Indians. The Indians of the Virginia region would not likely again to mistake the English for gods. The English, on the other hand, would be wary of expecting to find America divided into good Indians and cannibals with the good Indians eagerly awaiting English help. From this point, we can perhaps date the beginnings of the English disposition to regard all Indians as alike. As yet, however, it did not allow that, that the only good Indian was a dead one. When the first permanent English settlers arrived in America in 1607, their sponsors had not given up hope of an integrated biracial community. I think that's a lie. I don't know. Show me. Okay. In which indigent Englishmen would work side by side with, with, with willing natives under English government. I just don't, I, you know, that's what I was saying, you know. I just don't, I just don't think that that's true. But we're going to skip ahead because one of the... But I don't I don't necessarily buy that. I think when you look at the fact that they wanted to rule, that looks like imperialism off top for me. That looks like just blatant imperialism. We're gonna rule the world. And if you read the beginning about Drake, which I won't necessarily get into, it kind of gives you that feel, for lack of a better word. But go to page 110 because we ain't got we we trying to we trying to get ahead here. I'm trying to get speed. Let's go to page 110 real quick for me. Turn to 110 in your book. This goes. This goes to wealth. I want you to read. Now, when you go to page 110, go to that second paragraph towards the middle. A man could not make a fortune by himself. But if he could stay alive and somehow get control of a few servants and keep them alive, he could make more in a year than he was likely to make in several in England. And if he could get a large number of servants, he might indeed make a fortune. Go to the next paragraph towards the middle. Those who have what gold would will buy, get the gold a good deal easier and faster than the miners who dig it up. Now see, what they're talking about is how wealth moves. And wealth didn't just move in that way. Understand this. Look, go to page 111. I done turned the page. 
Women were scarcer than corn or liquor. That's real scarce. Women were scarcer than corn or liquor in Virginia and fetched a higher price. Seeking to overcome the shortage, the company dispatched shiploads of maids for whom prospective husbands were expected to pay. But the members were not large enough, but the numbers were not large enough to alter the atmosphere of transience that pervaded the city. We're going to give y'all women, we're going to give y'all everything, but y'all got to start staying in Virginia, not talking about how y'all going to run off somewhere because we can't do that. But hold on a second, page 162, let's talk about these women because, because white women have been telling us for a long time that they're victims and they're victimized. So let's talk about these women. Page 162, turn to it in your book for me. 162. Second paragraph, one third of the, the first top third of the way through, women had already exhibited their durability in the early days of the colony. See, men were dying. Women, these women were living longer. And so they were collecting husbands and collecting inheritances. You told me you ain't have no money. You told me we was all the same. You told me we was all minorities and all that stuff. But what I'm seeing from this book is you all were you all were wealth you were the wealth man people would come and, and bow on bended knee madam maiden i am going to court you better than sir badu i am going to get you as my wife because why because women lasted longer women lasted longer mean they outlasted their husbands means they inherited their husband you had women who you had widower when you had these widows who was widows and widows and widows and it went Pop, 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 just widow, you're a widow today, you're a widow tomorrow, and you can just inherit a bunch of stuff. Well, this husband did, and sometimes, if you look in this book, there's a couple times where it looked like they might have killed. Wasn't no forensics, wasn't no nothing, so if you killed the man, you just killed him. There was one time in the book where they said a woman, this one of these women, uh, uh, the neighbors, they told her, the court told the neighbors, you got to come check on him, because we think she's trying to kill him. Please go check on him because we think his wife, we think the wife is beating his ass at the house. Who does that? Okay. You know, I don't know. I don't know. Like, that was, what was page 162? Okay, let's go to 165 real quick. Stay with me. Women weren't just beating their husbands. Women, these women, these Virginia colony women were doing all kinds of madness. Understand me. I was, sh I was shocked and appalled. I was shocked and appalled and dismayed. Because this conduct was anything but ladylike. Listen. 160, this is page 165. Top of the page. In three cases where servants died after abusive treatments, women were the defendants. I thought y'all was hot house flowers. Y'all told me we were all the same and we were all in the same, but it's showing to me you beat your servants to death. Okay, let's go to the second paragraph. Same page, 165. If an awareness of their scarcity value induced an imperiousness or even downright tyranny in Virginia's women, it also gave them greater economic advantages than they enjoyed in England. By Virginia's law, as by England's, a widow was entitled to a life interest in one third of her husband's estate. And in Virginia, the annual un usufruct, usufruct of an estate was likely to amount to a larger proportion than in England. Y'all had an advantage. I don't know who y'all been playing with. I don't know who you've been playing with. Go to page 166. We are, I just want to reiterate this. But while the high mortality lasted with women apparently resisting it more successfully than men, Virginia was on the way to becoming an economic matriarchy. A matriarchy doesn't sound like you're on the bottom. A matriarchy, or rather a widowarchy. The man who needed capital could get it most easily from marrying a widow. The man who needed capital could get it most easily from marrying a widow. So wait a minute. What is all this stuff that I've been hearing? About how like you just like, like understand that men were, understand in Virginia what was happening. Men were deciding, I need to find this, I need to get me a widow 
who can get me stature. I can. Get, I need to get me somebody who has an estate. I need to find me somebody who can get me into the position I need to be in. But y'all were telling me that y'all were the same. No, you were valued at a certain rate because you had servants and later slaves. That's what created your value. How are you going to make yourself now equal well past that to the descendants of those slaves? Like once you start to read this stuff, you realize no, none of it makes sense. Somebody said rich booty. None of it makes any sense. The, the way that we're living, this is insane. Matriarchy. 168 really quick. Second paragraph. In making a will, men often named a guardian other than the mother to protect the children's interests. And in addition, appointed Theophies in trust to see that the guardian did his job properly. Well, why would you do that? Why would you do that? Why, 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 why wouldn't you assume that the mama was going to take care of the children? Why would you assume that the mama wasn't going to take care of the children and you need to appoint somebody? Well, it's quite simple. Go to page 170. It... They confronted this white woman about not taking care of the children. They said, you're not doing that. What? The, man, we got these people that's supposed to look over these orphan kids. And you're supposed to get the kids cattle and all kind of stuff. So what are you doing? And here's what she said. She said, it was unheard of, she said, that a mother should be asked to account for the property of her own children. She closed with a characteristic feminine touch. My, res my respects to yourself. And wife, most kindly, remember to whom I have sent a small basket of apples. Child, she said, if you don't leave me alone, I sent some apples to you and your family. If y'all don't go on ahead here somewhere, if y'all don't go on and leave me alone, you don't tell me how to spend the money on my kids. You don't tell me what to do. I'm going to do what I decide is best for me and my children. I'm not going to have you coming around here telling me what to do with my kids. I'm going to do what I want to do with my kids. And you do what you do what's best for you in your life. That's what she told him. Now understand this is a this is a woman, 1600s. But you're the same as me? Is that right? Is that right? Now we're going to get to George Washington and all of them marrying Martha. And it wasn't just Martha. They was all married. They was all marrying into women, widows and widowers and people, women who come from good stock and good family who had wealth. I think one of the things that this book kind of drives home is that we've all been conned. Well, you're, you're a woman, I am a woman, hear me roar, we are in this together. I think this pulls the con. No, we Negroes and you you ain't. That's what we are. I don't know what you're doing with your singing and the burning of the bra. We ain't never really been with all them theatrics anyway. That's some other stuff that you get to do. And you have been co-opting us in a way that's very unfortunate. So let me just let's let's just go. Let's just try to push on through, fam. I want you to go to 173 really, really quick. They didn't really build houses like that. They built little flappy houses because they were planning on being transient. But what you found is that they decided not to do it when they got what? Well, that explained to me why we view ourselves as ADOS as permanent outsiders. Because what happened was when the country started being stopped, started being good to them, as opposed to treating them as servants and having them be outside of the wealth class or outside of a class that could do anything for themselves, they viewed themselves as outsiders as well. Part of the reason we've always viewed ourselves as outsiders is because this country hasn't really given us our due in terms of us being true citizens, right? And so that's that kind of brought that home to me. You see on 175, the, 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 servants, the, the, the servants value, right? You see on one side, in, the, in demanding an annual accounting of orphans, cattle, the courts were guarding not, not merely against embezzlement, but against neglect that could destroy an inheritance overnight. They were guarding against the destruction of these, these little white Virginians inheritance. Mind you, we got brought in a little bit later as slaves. But they were guarding against inheritance. You know what else they were guarding against? 177 really quickly. Let's keep it moving. We're going to keep it moving. 177 really quickly. When there's instability, when a country is growing, and when a country has not been digitized as America has been digitized, where people can, they can pull you up on cameras, all that kind of stuff. There's a social security number to follow you. There's a credit report. 
Before all that happened, there was a way to gain wealth and gain wealth at the same time. Listen to this. This is page 177, first paragraph. A clever crook could take advantage of almost any transfer of property in a community where every business transaction was a high-risk adventure delicately balanced against the perishability of both the property and the participants involved. So you could say, my Aunt Etna died, and I'm over here. I, I'm over here uh, trying to get her properties. I'm, I'm trying to get Aunt Etna's properties, and she passed away. My name is Etna Jr. And you're going to look at me, and I'm going to look at you. And you're going to look at me, and I'm going to look at you. And whether or not you get it depends on a lot of stuff. That's whether or not you get it. Now go to page 205. We're halfway through the book. Let's go to page 205. We're going to talk about keeping people poor. We know a lot about that, don't we? Let's go midway through that paragraph. In 1661, Berkeley, you got to understand there was all these Bacon's Rebellion, there was governors. These are the players. Just understand when we use these names, these are the players. Bacon's led Bacon's Rebellion. And he led them, them, them indigent white people to, to do some awful, awful stuff. Okay, now, I'm not saying it's awful. I'm just saying it's from the mindset of the people who ruled that class. That's what they thought it was. I'm not saying anything about what Bacon did. Burn it all down. So anyway, in 1661, Berkeley forbade anyone to kill unmarked cattle. Unmarked cattle in the wild. He laying claim to them as, as due to him as being governor. He also claimed an annual tribute in Beaver from subject Indian tribes. Plus <coughs> 200 pounds of tobacco for every marriage license issued in Virginia. Plus 350 pounds annually for every tavern that retail drinks. Plus five shillings from every person leaving the colony. See, what, what, this is why, understand something. This is why government matters. When you do that, what you're doing, when you do that, what you're doing is basically saying, I am deciding who the winners and the losers are going to be. When you say that I am going to decide who gets, I'm going to say, it's because what happened was these white men was running off into the woods. We don't want to do this no more. We don't want to be working as servants. We're going to run off into the woods and we're going to handle our business over here. We don't want to do this stuff that you're talking about no more. We don't want to have no part in what you're talking about no more. And so they were going in the woods and hunting. And so what they were saying is you can't be killing no First, it was you can't kill nobody else's cattle. Then it was you can't kill no unmarked cattle. That was basically saying you got to go work for somebody. You can't be here in the woods with no gun. You got to just go work for somebody. And so I think what we have to be able... <coughs> As ADOS, what we have to understand is that the government has always selected winners and losers. And in America, they have always selected us as the bottom cast, as the loser. But they've always been playing this game. Even when they did this with the white peasants, that's what they did. They selected who the winners and losers were. And they selected that you all can't, people need you to be peasants. You And we're going to punish you for running off. We're going to punish you for all of that. And, and, and there was a new article, um... Uh, Alicia Garza announced she's a contributing editor of Marie Claire. The article is uh, Women Are the New Faces of Power. You know, I, I think one of the things we have to see is that and, and there's a new there's a book about that that, I'm, that I may present at the next book club book but I haven't really perused it enough to know. That's kind of grifterism. Right, because it's not about being a woman in terms of us. It's a terms of it's a, it's about being ados. I don't care how else you identify in this world. I don't care whether you identify as a woman. I don't care whether you identify as gay or lesbian. I don't care what. I don't care how else you identify. The central thing in your life, whether you know it or not, is this creation of race and what that has meant to you in your life. And so to say this is about women, that is again to me an effort of black women to kind of latch on to this, this white womanness that is that is roaring. Because we ain't roaring. Everything that we do is about race and is about the denigration of us as a race of people. They haven't even allowed us to be 
woman and man, right? Like it's not like it's not like if you're a heterosexual couple, your husband brings home the same amount as his comparable white white uh, uh you know white worker. And so like y'all all the same. Like that has never happened in our communities. So if he can't be a man in that context, how are you a woman? No, you're just a race of people who've been put at the bottom. And like the race has the, the people who've been made into a race because of lineage and phenotype have to come outside of that. And that has nothing to do with whether or not you have breast or vagina. It just doesn't. Let's just put that to rest. So when I say race, I'm talking about lineage. I remember back in the day, we, they used to talk about, well, you have to have race people. We need more race people. We know that race is a con, but in terms of what they were saying, they were saying we have to we have to have people who understand who we are in the context of this country and who stand up for that. And that's what we need right now. We don't need all this. We need people who stand up for who we are and what has been done to us in the context of this country. It has nothing to do with ovaries, though. Everything that has been done to us has, has had to do with the creation of race. And that's what this ADOSness is about. That's what this movement is about. It's not about anything else. It's not about ovaries. It's not about who has breasts, who doesn't. That is a white woman's fight because she has always wanted to have control. She's always had the money and she's always had that inheritance. But she wants control over that. And so she said, y'all come on, help me. I'm a, we're going to do this together. And it's always been like, it's always been a lie. And so let's go on to the next part because we got to keep it moving. When we talk about government, let's go to page 207, bottom. Every officer involved in the collection of revenues in Virginia claimed a share of them. The auditor got 5% of the shillings, of the, of the two shillings per hogs, head duty, simply for examining the collection accounts. And the high sheriff in East County added 10% for himself to the taxes he collected as well as charging assorted fees for serving warrants and making arrests. All public officers exacted fees for performing their duties and continually increased their charges authorized and unauthorized, both for, 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 for real and nominal services. What you have here is that without government, you're going to have to do that yourself. And you don't want to do that yourself. On page 209, they have the poll tax. And service are a form of wealth, right? Let's, let's understand that as we move on. Let's understand that the wealth is in labor. As we move on, let's understand that the wealth is in labor. As page 211. On page 211, as we keep it moving. Yet the prosperity that Virginia had enjoyed in the 1620s from high tobacco. This is tobacco. This is a tobacco state. From high, we ain't even into no cotton stuff yet. Tobacco. Tobacco prices was no boon to the rights and liberties for those who worked for other men. In the prosaic decades that followed... Virginians had developed institutions that gave a greater security and freedom and even a kind of prosperity to ordinary men, especially to those who managed to survive the term of years when a master could claim their services. But after mid-century, the, the, the prosperity of Virginia's big men, because they always talk about big men versus small men. That was part of the conversation. Big men in the face of low tobacco prices, and rising crops and population could not be widely shared, nor could the governmental authority that made it possible. As death loosened its grip on the colonies, kings and captains and governors right, uh, uh, tightened theirs and began once more to reduce the rights of those whose labors they depended. Remember that in Virginia that everybody used to die quick. The women, the women gained matriarchal powers because they didn't die quick. They, they died late and the men died quick. So there are, understand that there are so many things in flux that are determinants of power in this thing. Everything is kind of in flux and it's very interesting. And so you have in government, as we've talked about before, the ability to kind of tweak and decide who the winners and losers are going to be. But what starts to happen is the, the stuff just becomes too hot in terms of when I say too hot, I mean too hot for the for the um, for the people who work as servants and all that stuff. Now they said that you could be a servant for a certain amount of years and then they would extend the years and shorten the years based on different things. And it and, and but people wanted to be free. Isn't that something though? The white people wanted to be free. And so what they found is that, yeah, you can be free, but you being free means that someone else has to be on the bottom. You don't just get to be free. Somebody has to take that spot. 
And we have to be able to determine who takes that spot based on very specific things. There's not enough Indians. We done killed a bunch of them, and there's not enough of them. Native Americans. We done. They're not enough of them. Right? We have decided they got to be slaves too if we catch them, because we done tricked them and slaughtered a lot of them. But like we, it's so much easier to make you the this 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 slave that we've taken from Barbados or wherever Africa. It's so much easier to make you into the slave because there's this physical attribute that you have because what you find is that initially white servants and 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 black slaves had no issue with each other they had no issue they fought together they ate together they had babies together understand that america what became america made us enemies and made us a bottom and said that you can't deal with those people those people are contagion we're going to make laws that, that are so awful that you cannot be around those people. And we're going to steal from those people and give to you. We're going to steal from those slaves and give to you. It used to be a time where you could have a cow or whatever. Your master gave you a cow. But then, then the state said, we're going to take that. Whatever you grow, whatever extra you have as a, as a black slave, we're going to take all that. And, we're going to, and not only are we going to take it, we're going to redistribute it to white people. So white people were like, huh, wait a minute. I'm looking at my advantage here. If I'm looking at my advantage and I get something from you stealing from the slave, not only do I get like this psychological advantage that I'm not a slave and I can make use of you. And not only can I make use of you, I, I don't have to necessarily buy more servants. Like you used to have to like buy more servants. You had to buy more white people after that time was up. No, no, no. I can just rape the black woman and have little mulatto babies. But, but since... Freedom was attached. Freedom was attached to the mother. So initially, whether a child was free or not was whether the mother was free. If the mother was a slave, I don't even have to buy another slave. I can just keep raping you and having little slave babies. And, like, I can have a bunch of them for free. Now, they, they changed that later because what was happening is the black men was like, Psh. they was with the white women and having a bunch of mulatto babies. So... That dwindled down the number of, of, of white women who were available to white to white men because black men was doing their thing. So listen, they, white men can compete. So you're in a whole other thing now, right? Because all these little mulatto babies running around. So you gotta do you gotta start making laws. And the laws that they made basically said you had no rights. Even after even if we allowed you to be here after we changed the law a, as a free black person, you got no rights. You have no rights. And what you need in a society, what you need in a country, you got to have rights. You got to have them. There's no way to do it without it. Servants were running away. If you look at um, page like 217, you see how they was running away and doing all kind of stuff. They was run. I had never heard of runaway servants. Listen to this. In 1669, this is page 217, first paragraph. In 1669 and 1670, new laws provided rewards to to anyone apprehending a runaway this is a servant with the provision that the servant not only reimbursed his master by by double service for the time missed but but that he also reimbursed the public by serving further time at a rate at the rate of four months for every 200 pounds of tobacco expended on the reward for apprehending him this is some wild stuff. You know, America always been so wild. That's one of the things you learn too. Even when you go to page, go to page 239 real quick. 239. And you see like, when you talk about gun culture, when you go to page 239, though there were not enough blacksmiths to keep guns in proper repair, though powder and shot had been had, had to be brought from England, life in Virginia required guns. You needed guns to protect your cattle from wolves and the counties, even long established ones, paid bounties throughout the, the century for the wolves killed within their boundaries every year. You needed guns to protect your cornfields, not only from the birds, but from animals that broke, that broke into them. Although it was against the law, many of the farmers took angry took angry shots at the horses when they tried to jump the fence. Listen, this is a necessity of guns. 
America was wild. And slaves didn't have any guns when they came. So you had this 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 wild, wild west type of area. That you had this wild, wild west where you needed a gun in order to be free. In order to freedom, liberty, you needed a gun. Slaves ain't have no guns. Slaves ain't have no hope. There's a point here where he talked about how um, the actual, um, the, 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 the white people had hope. And that was a problem because they always knew they were supposed to be free. You had to bring in black people, um, whether they be from Africa or Barbados or wherever, who had no hope. And when you talk about Barbados, you're talking about, you're talking about someone who was brought over here. When we talk about slaves, people are like, well, we all African. He's talking about someone who was brought over here involuntarily versus somebody who flies over here voluntarily and tries to say to you the same thing. And once we got here and there's no way to go home, it's not like it, it's not like it is now. You can get a ticket anywhere. No, the voyage, you're not going back. You're here. This is your home now. When you, when you step foot on that sand, America's your home. You are a slave in a new country. And some of them, the ones from Barbados actually spoke English, a lot of them. So they were able, that's why they were able to be so friendly with the whites and they were all the same. Until Virginia and Virginia government kind of cleaved them apart. It's, so when you see Joy Reid say something like, well, it's just about different points. of No, it's not true. That's not what happened. You don't understand history. You don't understand life. I don't know what to tell you. You have Bacon's Rebellion. Y'all saw Bacon's Rebellion. Bacon's Rebellion, these, these white people who have problems, they finna revolt and they finna cause all kind of other problems, right? So you have a problem as a, as, a, as a colony with these people who are revolting because of everything that's happening. The powder keg, the, the, the land. Land was everywhere. Land was superfluous. Like land was worth nothing. Basically, these people got all these landees. What was worth something was labor, was the ability to work the land. So imagine how much land you could have got back then. Because land wasn't worth nothing. But see, the thing that, that, that matters is that they took us off the board. We weren't even allowed to, like, be a part of that. We were the thing used to work the land as slave labor. And again, on page 275, let's go to page 275 as we kick all the way through the book. Beverly, it says, Beverly was entrenched. You all, you read, you know who Beverly was entrenched in his place in the assembly. Lovewell held the strongest office short of governor uh, uh in the colony and when beverly died soon after his return to england lowell was able to buttress his position by marrying lady berkeley man these women were not women these women were these women were they were bargaining chips men were coming after them lady 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 berkeley i would like to have your hand look. can we have a chivalrous dating time please like, because that's what it was, because they needed you, because of who you were, and the money that you come from, and everything. Like, this idea that, like, you were, you were the same as us. Like, you were outside working in cotton fields, and they made you all Negroes. On 289, you go to 289, we have this whole conversation about capital. It says, the well-to-do intermarried and built up intricate networks of family who tended to act together. That's in the 1600s. Now, if you was a slave all the way through Jim, then, then, then all the way through Reconstruction, Jim Crow, and you just now here, we just now kind of barely free. What do you think that looks like for us? They were working out them networks all the way back then. What do you think? What do you think? What do you think this means for us? I mean, I'm just trying to get an understanding. Marriage was power. Social capital was plow power. It was all power. And you go to page 304, I'm skipping ahead. I probably done skipped a bunch of stuff. But it's so much stuff in the book. It's a long book. But if you go to 304, it says, Englishmen with spare cash from came to Virginia uh, uh, also, also, became, also because the, the prestige and power that a man with any capital could expect in Virginia was comparatively greater, much greater than he was likely to attain in England. And go up above the top paragraph. Ten slaves might make 20,000 pounds of tobacco in a good year, which at the time 
Fitzburg wrote would be worth from 100 to 200 sterling. The cost of feeding them would be nothing and clothing them little. The return on the investment would be accordingly a good deal, more, more, than, more than could be expected from agricultural enterprise in England. Like what happens if you don't get to be a part of the scramble though? That's a scramble for power. That's a scramble for money. But what if you aren't a part of the scramble? This is all about cost and timing. As I move all the way through so we can get to the phones. This is about cost. This is about timing. You see that on 301. You see that on 301. They talk about tobacco and sugar. When you go into 30, when you go into 304, you see the same thing. Like we just talked about, right? No cost of slaves. When you go, let me go to the next thing we're going to go to. When you go to 308, what you see is that it ended a threat. Like, these people were, these people were like, hey, they're going to come for us. The substitution of slaves near the bottom, the, the, last, the last paragraph to the last paragraph. The, the second to the last paragraph. So substitution of slaves for servants gradually erased and eventually ended the threat that the freedom, that the freedmen posed. I'm talking about the free white men, right? As the annual number of imported servants dropped. There was no limit to the work or time the master could command from his slaves. Beyond his need to allow them enough for eating and sleeping to enable them to keep working. Even on, even on that, he might skimp. Robert Carter of, of Nominee Hall accounted a humane man made it a policy to give his slaves less food than they needed and required them to fill out their diet by keeping chickens and by working Sundays in small gardens at their cabins. Listen, I ain't gonna really feed you. I ain't really got time for that. I don't really have time for that. Like, I don't know. I don't know what you're gonna do. You're just gonna have to eat from from whatever you eat from. And they eat, you're just gonna have to figure this stuff out. I'm not gonna feed you like that. I'm gonna feed you, but I'm not gonna feed you like that. You're gonna have to get this little plot of land right in your garden and you figure it out. You figure out how you go eat. I'm going to give you two chickens, okay? You do some eggs or whatever you're going to do, but I'm not really feeding you. And you, listen, you can do, you can do everything I need you to do by eating as, as less as possible. Got it? Got it. Good, good. And if you go to page 312, they said they could kill the slaves. Not only kill them casually, but they could, they could, they could just... They could, they, there's one section where they talked about topic, chopping off the toes of incredulous slaves. They chopped off their toes. So like, I, I don't know. And they said that, um, if you go to page 309, they said one of the great things about, about slaves is like, the, like I said, the freedmen had hope. Children is property, killing. If you go to, go to page 310 really quick, you'll see that like, part of this whole thing was to deal with the hierarchy so it created a like new hierarchy where the these white men got to be on head again right even if they were peasants they got to move up and that's what they wanted that was freedom so in order for white america to be free what does that mean we had to be slaves that's what it means let me go to 321 as we move through it in a movement that Michael Foucault has called the Great Confinement, they everywhere founded institutions in which the sick, the criminal, and the poor were indiscriminately taken in charge. The purpose was not merely to get them out of the way, but to make them contribute what they could to national wealth. So they was all they was all doing different stuff. But what happened was in trying to get people to like bow down or whatever you want to call it. But race was just, race be just race became the most effective mechanism for it. Oh, we got it. We got it. These people, they brown and other people's white. We're going to just, and we can't have them together. We can't have them together because they're going to have little mulatto babies. And everybody's going to start looking alike. They got to be over here and the white people got to be over here. That's what the government did. And understand that what we're doing, like we probably, I'm not saying everybody will look alike. But like. Please, if, if, if everybody, if they had just left us all be, we'd just be whatever, doing whatever we wanted to do. We wouldn't even see it that way. You can understand the servants didn't necessarily see 
the the slaves as any they did rebellions with the slaves they had babies with the slaves there was no difference until the government decided to come in and say we're going to force you to see a difference we're going to we need these slaves to be a bottom cast and that's what we're going to use the government to enforce that that's what happened and we're still living the consequence of that I don't know how anybody, if you go to 325, the contempt that lay behind these proposals and behind many of the workhouse schemes is not easy to distinguish from the kind of contempt that 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 we call racism today. No, no shook, Sherlock. And you saw even on page 331, they talk about how even in the homes, like the kids learned how to be bullies because to, to because the little white kids played with the slave kids. Not because they were friends, they learned how to be bullies and learn how to be better than you. And that's something they never kind of disabused themselves of. And if you go to page 334, we were talking about mixed people. It says, it's very interesting. It says, when they talk about mixed marriages, such marriages were by no means unknown in Virginia. In Northumberland County in 1656, Elizabeth K., a mulatto woman, a mulatto woman, whose father had been freed sued for, for her freedom through an attorney william greenstead who was apparently right after the suit succeeded greenstead married her in northampton county francis payne a negro who was married to a white wo was married to a white woman named amy who remarried with the white with the white man william gray after payne's after payne's death Amy's second marriage was evidently less successful than the first, for she was soon complaining to the court that her new husband was bearing her and was beating her. Oh, she was being beat, was beating her and wasting the estate she, she brought him. She brought him. Wasting the estate she brought him. Okay. Another case of mixed marriage appears in Norfolk County. Uh, records where a question was raised in 1671 as to whether Francis Skiff, Skipper's wife was tithable. The court decided that since she was a Negro, she was indeed tithable. Skipper, who appears in the records at various times, was never identified as a Negro and almost certainly white. He was executed for murder in 1679. Oh. But Anne was still living as a widow in Norfolk in 1691. A more remarkable case was that of Hester Tate, an English servant of Jamestown, Westcombe, and Westmoreland, Westmoreland County, who was legitimately married to James Tate, a slave of, of, of Patrick Spencer. In 1691, the couple had four mulatto children, three of whom were in that year apprenticed to Spence, to Spence and the other Westcombe. The act, go to the next page, 135. The act provided extensive punishments for miscegenation. There's a new act passed because all these people is marrying because they understand they're all the same. They understand this stuff ain't for skin deep and it ain't, it's, just, it's a game. But they want, but they have to be laws against that. The act provided extensive punishment for miscegenation in or out of wedlock. A white man or, or, or woman who married a Negro, mulatto, or Indian, was to be banished from the colony. But later they changed it to something else other than banishment. It's a lot just to create division. Division amongst the ranks. Division, division, division. If you go to place 336, lots of mulattoes in, in, in Westmoreland. In Westmoreland from 1690 to 1698, 14 white women were punished for having a total of 19 illegitimate children, of which at least four were mulatto. Okay, the result of such unions could be a blurring of distinction between slave and free, black and white. The children would ultimately become free and might constitute an intermediate class of neither black nor white. Neither black nor white. They always knew that this stuff was garbage. And they always knew that if we were allowed to mix and intermingle as a labor class of people who did the work for the elite, we will realize ain't this some stuff. Now people will be like, Yvette, well, why don't you why aren't you in favor of burning now? Or or universal politics, since we are the same. Because this is a historical 400 plus year oppression. Once you fix this. 
through reparations and everything that comes with it, then we can talk about our commonality. But you have to fix that injury. I didn't do it. America did it. Now you have to fix that injury and then I will have a conversation with you about commonality. But you made us uncommon. You made us black and white. Now once you decide you want to fix all that up and you tell me how you're going to do it, then we can have a whole conversation. I ain't got no problem with talking to you about what has to happen. You know, you go to page 365, they had, they had, the, we're talking about the white peoples. They had land grants. They had to vote. And one of the things that happens with the vote is that when you talk about it and you see the conversations, they had media. So they started having media, media in, 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 in debates. And one of the things that occurred to me is that one of the problems that we have is that we don't have black media, so we can't have the conversations with each other. Forget everybody else who's involved. We can't even have the conversations with this, with each other. One thing that's so important about break about ADOS and this Breaking Brown platform is that we're having the discussion with each other, right? When you look at the Gazette in this book and everything that happened with it, one of the things that you find is that that led to kind of like what ended up leading to uh, to America being a country and all this stuff is that there was a debate and there was a political discourse. We don't have that political discourse and we don't have it because we don't have black media anymore. And you see, you see the importance of the absence of that media with this. And even with, you know, even with patriotism, you go to page 368 with patriotism, what you see is that you know, these peasants who came from England or wherever, that they became more patriotic as they gained more wealth and they gained more power. And one of the things I've always wondered is kind of like, how are we as ADOS consider ourselves a permanent outsider? And you come to the conclusion that we consider ourselves as that because America has not been good to us. So when the country is not good to you, you see yourself as a transient. And even in Virginia, like the white men didn't really build houses that were nice houses because they saw themselves as transient. And even if you go, there's a page in here, I lost it with George Washington and his family. And they were talking about Thomas Jefferson and they all married Mrs. Washington and they married into this wealth and the parents built this. It shows that white wealth is held in white family. White wealth is not held in any male individual. Like a male would marry into the family, male and female, and like he will become part of that family or he will marry a widow. Like those are things in terms of how you structure a group that we have never had access to. And people are saying, well, why can't you just pull yourself up by the bootstrap? No, why can't you just know American history enough to know that like you don't know what you're talking about? That's kind of where we are. So we're at the hour mark, fam. I want to, um, I'm going to, I'm going to take a quick break as usual. Set up the phones and call in and tell me what you thought about the book. I hit the main points I thought I could, but the stuff I didn't hit or whatever, call in and let's have a conversation about it. All right, fam.
All right, family, we are back and we are going to have a conversation. I want to hear what y'all think. I want to go through the calls and let's have a conversation. Let's just relax. Y'all relax and do what y'all do. Sip your libations and we're going to have a conversation. 609, I'm coming to you. 609, what's your name? Where you calling from? And tell me what you think. How you doing, is that? My name is Dow from South Jersey. What's going on? And, um, hey, you going on? Let me tell you, you fam. this book just has so much to unpack. That's why it had to be so long. I tell you, there are so many things that they talk about, he talked about in that book that are parallel to today's society mm. that is easy to see. Okay. You know, but the, let me let me just grab a couple of different items here because okay. I don't want to be on too long because I can take up I can take all the rest, <laughs> of, the rest of the time you got. But now you got to remember, in the beginning, they sent them. They came over here because there was nothing going on in England. So yep. they had to have some for all them people. Mm -hmm. So they said, okay, going over there to America, and we give you all the free land you want, and we'll let you out of jail, you get it. Okay? But the thing is, when they got over there, mm. they had to have some kind of power structure. So the king, he said to the, to the, to the big wigs that became... Um, governors and everything, look, I'll give you a, a, um, some land from what I owe you on a debt. Yeah. So that's how they set it up. And then, when, then when the governors got over there, they set up all these tax collectors and all of that stuff that were their friends that separated them from the debtors that were in jail. Now, the tricky part came here. They wanted to figure out how they can make them work, but because they were so shiftless and <laughs> didn't want to work, they had to make them work. Like you said, they could beat them, they could do whatever they want. But the problem came in as time passed, they couldn't control them because, mm -hmm. remember, as the population got bigger in America, those slaves, not slaves, excuse me, those servants could run off to a different part of the country, and since they was white, they could blend in. Yeah, that's true. But because now they could get blacks in there, they stood out no matter where they were. And since they knew that these were slaves, they had a product that they could differentiate really. That's true. And, uh, you know, so... That is right there where the line of demarcation began. We got these blacks that's easily identifiable. Plus, now we can control these bottom class whites because we worried about them coming to get us too. Because they see what we got, want what we got, we don't want them to have it. So if we give them a little bit here and tell them they're better than these blacks, then we control the whole thing and we can stuff our pockets. Yep. And those, therein lies all the similarities of today's world, but that's at different levels. Mm, yeah. And I'm going to let you speak on that. And that's all I got to say, sis. I appreciate that's it, fam. You know what? Like, like you're right. Like, the thing is, like, that's the parallel. Like, okay. The thing that's the parallel, and I appreciate it, fam, what you just said is somebody's got to be the bottom. These white men didn't come here, and these white servants and these white women did not come here with an expectation that they would be the bottom. They came here with an expectation for a better life. So they're not fit to be the bottom. We're going to make these Negroes the bottom, but the problem with the Negroes being the bottom is that the white servants don't see any difference in them than them. They see them all the same because they're doing the same work. So we have to put in place laws that not only give the whites an advantage, a, a, a psychological, in some cases, a, a monetary, in a lot of cases, a monetary advantage from owning these slaves, 
We have to put that in place to advantage them so they will start to see the slaves as different. And we're going to we're going to put in laws that like the slaves can be beaten naked in public or whatever. We can cut the slaves toes off. Well, we didn't cut your toes off. And so you'll begin to see these people as different than you expect, especially when it's in your best interest to do so. That's what we are. And that's what happened. And we are living the consequence of that today. That was not a mistake. It was not happenstance. It was not, oops, I did it again. It is what it is. And the question is for us, what are we going to do about it? So I'm going to my next call. I'm going to 301. 301, what's your name? Where you calling from? What's on your mind? Good evening, Sister Yvette. How you doing? This is Marshall calling from the D.C. area, the DMV. How you feeling this evening? I'm pretty good. How about you? I'm good, sister. I'm good. Okay, I'm going to uh, try to get through this because I have to say that I finished this book all of three hours ago. So uh, <laughs> it, was, it was a rush to get through it, but, but I got through it. It was long. It. it was long, um, so that's fine. It was long. It was long and drawn out and tobacco. I forgive everybody for finishing this book late. It was all kind of stuff about how you plant the, the tobacco weed. I was like, child, you don't stop. So I understand. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. I, first off, I have a question for you. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think this was the right title for this book? No, I don't. I, I oh, I'm so happy you asked that question. I do not. I think this book should have been called something. Neither do I. I think this. I think. I think this book should have been called something like Power in Virginia or Power in Twenty First. I mean, in, in, in Seventeenth Century America yeah. or something like that. Like it should not, I don't think it should be called American Slavery, American Freedom. Because like, I don't think he no. spent enough time. I got what he was saying on slavery, but I really don't think in terms of specificity, he spent enough time on it to give it that name. Now, I think. Absolute, I, absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Because my thing was, I was going to call the book Systems and Hypocrisy or Systems and Irony, yeah. something like that. Because it, it spoke so much about the systems to yeah. eventually set up American um, freedom and so forth. And he spoke on slavery in the last book thoroughly. Yeah. But at least, but it was still pre-colonial. He spoke about it in the last book. He spoke more about the slavery that, like, the, 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 the servants were through. Like, you had these three levels of servants. You had the tenants. You had the ordinary bond servants. You had the apprentice apprenticeship. And he spoke about the levels of not only how they were treated, but how, like, you could have your serv your indentured servitude. If you committed a crime, you know, um, you could go to um, whatever county court and, you know, your master could take it back and you had to serve another seven years, all that stuff. So I'm like, he was speaking on slavery from their perspective, but being ADOS, I'm trying to put it in our content, and I'm like, damn, I gotta get all the way to page 300 before he's even touching on that. Yeah, so, and not even, not even, I wanna... not even that, fam. Let me just say this. Part of the problem with the part of the problem was not just even like the late time that he got to it, right? Part of the problem was, yeah. and the reason I selected this book, and I did enjoy the book, I just enjoyed the book in terms of his history, and I think it did okay. But I kept reading this yeah. book. Like, I'm reading all these articles and all these studies. And everybody keeps bringing me back to this book. So I'm like, I'm going to do this book with the family. I'm just going to read this book. But it's just like, I wonder, I kind of wonder, fam, if that's something that you got to do in 75, right? Like, you got to write a book <clears throat> and you got to just put us at the end and say that's what it was, say that's what it was about, right? Say, because the book, was, yeah. the book was very important, but it wasn't important in terms of slavery as much as what led up to slavery. Like, it gave you the best yeah, context of go. what led up to there it. There you go. Um, okay. Um, also, I want to get into, forgive me, I, I lost a piece of note here. Here we go. When you're talking about systems, it goes all the way back when you're speaking, and when you're talking in that first chapter about the guy, and I'm going to kill his name, but it's Richard Hackloyd. Hack, I know who you're talking about. A K L U. Yes, yeah, something yeah. strange. H-Y-K-U-L-I-T, something like that. Yeah, thank you. Um, H A K. I'm gonna forget it anyway, because I'm against time. He wrote that book called The Principal Navigations of the English Nations in 1589, and basically that was their blueprint for MP 
materialism. And the reason yeah. why I go back to my time, like systems and hypocrisy, this guy never got on the boat. He never was around royalty or people of power, but he basically wrote this blueprint of how you colonize, how you can, yeah. how you can defend yourself on foreign soil to colonize. But they were, the English, he was writing it from the way of, the English was so afraid of the Spaniards and the way they enslaved, he wrote it like, okay, we want the same thing that the Spanish have, but we'll be kinder, gentler colonists. And I'm like, mm, okay, yeah. you, you're giving a system, but your hypocrisy is writing in the same damn book. Mm. So uh, th that's where I'm going off of. Yeah, and, that was, um, you know, that, that I didn't get into, I didn't get into that first part, but that first part was kind of interesting in terms of how all these people who had really never sailed or anything were talking about yeah. how best to oppress people and how the English were better mm -hmm. than the Spanish. Like there's a whole part about the Spanish versus the English and, and, and how they yeah. were, well, the Spanish yeah. are just too cruel. We're going to do better in terms of our oppression. They've been doing this for a long time. <laughs> That's what I thought. I was like, Jesus. Yeah. Right, Here is a absolutely, and I'm quick. I got two more things, and I'm gonna get you off from. Okay. I know a lot of people are trying to call in. Let me read you page ninety for anybody that's listening. Turn to page ninety real quick. It's the last page of the full chapter where it talks about the Jamestown fiasco. Okay. This is crazy, and I couldn't get this out of my mind. I'll start it off. If you were a colonist. You knew that your technology was superior to the Indians. Mm. You knew that you were civilized and that they were savages. It was evident that your firearms, your clothing, your housing, your government, your religion was better than the Indians. The Indians were supposed to be overcome with admiration and to join you in extracting riches from the company. But your superior technology had proven inefficient to extract anything. The Indians keeping to themselves, laughed at your superior methods and lived from the land more abundantly and with less labor than you did. They even furnished you with food um, that you somehow did not get around to growing yourselves. And thus to be condescended by the heathen savages was intolerable. And when your own people started dis deserting in order to live with them, it was too much. It came to that the whole enterprise of Virginia would be over. So you killed the Indians, tortured them, burned their villages, burned their cornfields. It proved your superiority in spite of your in spite of your failures. And you gave similar treatment to any of your own people who succumbed to that savage way of life. But you still did not grow much corn. That was not what you came to Virginia for. I'm like, damn. Right there. <laughs> but fam, hold on, fam. I, I couldn't, as I'm reading, I couldn't, I go through the whole book, I couldn't get that page out of my head. And damn, um, what the crazy thing is when you read the chapter underneath it, so we talk about the legend of John Smith the Pocahontas, the guy who basically saved Virginia, who brought about tobacco, and the mass production of it was a guy named John Rose, who ended up marrying Pocahontas. So I'm like, damn. Yeah, <laughs> Listen, fam. Listen, listen. Did you see? Hold on. Did you see the part where they talked about what happened if you left to go and live with the Indian? Like they tore your body apart. There was a part in there where they talked about how they tortured you by tearing your limbs apart. And what was the offense? Running away with the Indians. Like all because you were a failure. Like they were living good. They were living good off of like not doing a lot of work. You just didn't know what you were doing. But let me just say this before I go into that. My pro I have a problem with the Native Americans, the Indians, whatever. Like I have a problem with them because they kept getting getting got by these people. These people keep getting you. Like you know that they ain't nothing. They keep <laughs> God damn, how many times you gonna show up to the parlay for them to slaughter you? God dang. <laughs> They said in the earlier page where, like, the Indians knew that. The Indians knew if they would have just left the colonists alone, they would have starved and died off. And I'm thinking, unlike the Denmark VC book where you kind of had people to chip for. You had Telemark, with, with the yep. name Denmark VC to chip for. You had yep. Dollar Jack to cheer for. You had those who were conspiring to cheer for. Here, I'm like, I, I want to cheer for the Indians, but damn it, it's, it's almost like their idleness got the best of them when dealing with the no, thank you, fam. I I want to thank you. Always say to give. But let 
me just say this for you, go fam. I didn't understand it either. Like, I kept seeing these stories of the Indians showing up to, like, meetings. And it's like, every time y'all show up to meetings, they kill you. <laughs> I don't know why y'all still showing up to meetings no more. What you showing up to meetings for? They gonna slaughter you. That happens every time y'all show up to meetings. <laughs> what you doing? Uh, real quick, real quick, I just want to say you always ask us to give recommendations about book club coming sure. up. And yeah, last, I just want to, I just want to give you some quick ones. But you always mention when affirmative action was white. Yeah. Let's do a book club on that for our campus. Right. Um, there's another great book that kind of coincides with the color of law. It's called Not in My Neighborhood by Antero Pitella. A N T R O P I E T I L A. Put that on the list, maybe. And third, the half has never been told by Ooh. Edward Baptiste. That you need to. I'm just starting to read that one. And when you want to talk about systems of slavery, yeah, I read that one. I got, I got to read it again. Though. You know, I'm like, you know what? I since I, I always tell people that when affirmative action was white, is the first book to read. So I think maybe we have to do that one. Then the half has never been told because I've recommended both of them, but I've never had them as a book club. So I think maybe when the first Jackson was white, that might need to be the next one because I always recommend it, but I never, I, we, we haven't had a book club. This is not our second one, but I think this may be that you might be right, fam. I, 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 I approve. <laughs> <laughs> it's all you, sis. All right, good night. Peace to the Breaking Brown family. Um, and I'll talk to you again soon. And uh, like I said uh, earlier in the week, I'm trying so hard to get there in Louisville to um, meet you and Tone and the rest of the Breaking Brown and Tone. All talk right, family. all right, <laughs> fam. All right, I appreciate you calling in. That was a, that was a great call. Yeah, I never understand. Like they just went. What did we just gonna have to kill him? That's what the, that's that's what the, he just read. Basically said. But I never understood why he just kept showing up to the parlay. Why you keep showing up to the parlay? Don't nothing could ever happen with the parlay with the white people. Y'all just keep showing up and keep getting slaughtered. I don't understand it. I don't understand why y'all still doing business with the people because they keep... Let them starve. Why you didn't let them starve? I just don't understand what happens in the minds. Anyway, I'm going now to 404. 404, what's your name? Where you calling from? And what's on your mind? You there, 404? Hello, can you, hello, can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. What's going on? Well, hello, Yvette. This is Chanel, and I live in Georgia. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing pretty good, Chanel. How about you? Oh, pretty good. I love your show. I am a monthly contributor. Thank you. I appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. Hey, I just want to, I know a lot of people want to get in. I have two statements I want to read. Okay. One is on page 129, and I love this statement. It really talks about how this country was started. And 129? Okay. 129? Okay. It says, in boom time, Virginia, then we can see not only the fleeting ugliness of private enterprise operating temporarily without check, not only greed magnified by opportunity, producing fortunes for a few and misery for many. That, that talks about everything. We talk about Amazon. We talk about Walmart. I mean, they already set up by 1620. And the last one I want to make a point of is on page 269. Okay. It's about Berkeley either did not perceive or choose not to exploit the opportunities presented by the hatred of white Virginians against India. But for those with eyes to see, there was an obvious lesson in the rebellion. Resentment of an alien race might be more powerful than resentment of an upper class. Mm. Love mm. what you're doing, sis. I plan on being there in October. Mm. Have a wonderful night. Oh, thank you. Thank you, fam. Oh, they gave the blueprint. That's the blueprint, fam. That's the blueprint. Resel re re a, a resentment of an alien race. And how is it easier to put an alien race? They're dark. They're darker. They have kinky hair. And then when you said, well, what about the mulatto mulattoes? They're light too. We're going to throw them in the bag too. Before it was, well, if you're attached to the mother, the, the, the freedom comes through the mother. So if, if the mother is a slave, then, then that's a slave. But if the mother is white, then that's white. Then no, it was like after that, it's like, no, we're not doing it no more. They all, they, they all in the same boat. We're going to resent this class. One drop and all of that. Ooh. Y'all got some good quotes tonight. I'm going to 775, 775. What's your name? Where you calling from? What's on your mind? Hey, Yvette. This is Dar from the West Coast. What's going uh, on, fam? Before by, uh, 
Good. How you doing? My, uh, my, my segue is going good. I'll make sure that's better this time. <laughs> I'm here to say thank you so much for having this show tonight. Thank you. You're welcome, man. You're helping. You are helping us understand the gravity of not having our own media mm. to help us. You know, because this right here in the phone, if you were running your own television show, if you had, you running your own television station, excuse me, you would be programming these type of shows oh, reminding man. not only black people, but the whole world what we have gone through in the last 400 years. Uh, uh, I mean, I was just looking at George Wallace Okay, I, a quick backdrop. I was looking into this college scandal. Mm -hmm. And then I started going back to a recent history, the George Wallace days, when, when George Wallace was having a shooting contest with JFK just to get black people in college at all. Uh, look, uh, I, I read a book similar to this one, which was called uh, uh, Before the Mayflower. And a lot of strange things started happening to black folks right around the formation of the Constitution. Mm. And even the white, excuse me. I know. I was just. I was just. I was just talking. Go on, fam. I'm sorry. Well, well it, 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 this might be the same writer. And um, it, 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 a lot of strange things started happening because I think they knew and understood the consequences and the gravity of what black people played in not only forming this country, but continuing it right on up to when Malcolm X started telling on everybody in Africa, back when Africa had just broke away from Europe. And he started telling on the United States, the only reason why I think we have the freedoms we have now because the United States became a world power. Ooh. And they were just, we were as a country just embarrassed. So well, you know, that's a, you, know, fam, you know, fam, there's a good book about that. God, what is that book? I read that book, Cold War something. But there's a good book about how that basically says that like America got shamed. Um, from from the world into like giving us rights because we were talking about what y'all do in Russia and Russia was like what are you doing to the Negroes uh, JFK and and that's and that's that's the thing God I, that might have to be one of our book club books too gee it's too many books it's too many books in this life but go on film sorry but, but you bet, this is what's scaring me so much with the immigration policy now mm -hmm. once upon a time the rest of the world was uh, a sympathetic to what African Americans were struggling with in this country. The Africans were once sympathetic Very to what so. we were going with. Very much so. But it, but it seems like now everybody's in on this caper. And everybody's winking and nodding behind our backs. Well, you know what happened, though, fam? The people who were sympathetic to us, just like the assassinations happened in this country. I, You know, I was reading this article in The Atlantic a while back, and it wasn't just like MLK, like cars blew up. It wasn't just Fred Hampton. There was a lot of people, who, there was a lot of ADOS who got assassinated. The same thing happened on the continent. The people who were sympathetic towards us in terms of leaders of that country got assassinated got assassinated so what happened is when those people got assassinated the people who took over for them were in the bag in the bag with in the bag with the people who killed them and so that's okay. what we're struggling with right now like we're struggling with we're struggling with what happened with that bloodletting like that's where we are right now people say oh, Yvette you're xenophobic no I understand that the people you have in power now and these African countries are not the people who were in power back then I can have a I can have a meeting with Lumumba all day and we will be in agreement but you sir are not Lumumba and that's the problem that we're running into they have replaced them with these kind of western puppets and so there's no way forward through them or with them to do anything and nobody's acting like they recognize the difference Yvette, I'm here to tell you, you are the only person who is doing what you're doing anywhere on the internet. You're the only person who's taking time out to 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 put a uh, 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 shine a light on the truth of something very substantive, and that's our history. Mm. And you, you're the you're the only person who's doing that, and as a result, it's causing it's giving you that much more substance as a leader and someone 
one who will champion me. You know, cause I really appreciate what you're doing. You. I've been following okay. you since you were in your 1600s. I said, you know what? This woman is for real. Mm -hmm. She's the only person who's resonating something that could start a second civil rights in this. Look, you, look, you. Thank you for thank having you. this show, and thank you for taking time out to explain the gravity behind your argument and how powerful it would be if we had to go to court. Mm. Have a good night. Mm. Thank you, fam. Like, like part of the problem, part of the problem is like in terms of like you know why do a book club or why talk about the books or why recommend the books. There's a good reads up by by the way for those of you who don't know with the books that have been typically recommended um, if you're new here. But that's because you have to have a political foundation. Like if you don't have a political or historical foundation of where you come from and what what got us here in this predicament. Like, you don't understand anything. And so what happens is people get in the street hollering, and you don't really understand how we got to this space. And that's absolutely essential, and that's absolutely necessary. And one of the things that I love about this moment is not just the clarity of seeing who, who the people are who are not in solidarity with us. It's seeing us all, me included, us all grow and move. Like, the, the woman who just called, like, I went to that page. And I saw what she said, but I didn't have it highlighted. Why don't I have that highlighted? I have a lot of stuff highlighted in this book. I have like a lot of stuff. Why? Because this is a collective. This is not event. This is not Antonio. This has to be a collective effort. Nothing works. Like a lot of people like to just be the, be the HNIC, the head Negro in charge. It don't work that way. It don't work unless you are part of a collective effort and you are building towards a collectivism. That's what we are. That's what has to happen. And I, you know, I just, you know, people say, Yvette, aren't you bothered by everybody, the, the attacks? No, not really. I'm okay. I, I, Cause I'm really loving this moment. I'm loving the co collectivism that we have in this moment and what we're learning and how we're growing and how we're moving. I'm not bothered by any other stuff. So 402, I'm coming to you. 402, what's your name? Where you calling from? What's on your mind? Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. What's going on? Oh yes, uh, my name my name is Daniel. I'm in I'm in Brooklyn. What's going uh, on, Daniel? I've been watching your show for a while, and um, I like I like what you're doing. I'm kind of new to this, but um, I've okay. been listening to you a lot. Okay. What's on your mind? Yes. Uh, basically, I wanted to say um, uh, I know this might be a little off topic, but in terms of uh, ADOS, I think um, black people we have a long way to go to get reparations, and it might take longer than 2020. It might take. I was watching a few videos. Daniel, online, you got Daniel, you got anything to say? You got anything to say about it? For us to get for us to get uh, justice. I'm sorry, I gotta let Daniel go because I'm talking about a book tonight. We can talk about that later. I'm I'm open to having discussions on a later date about everything else but i can't i i'm not I'm, i want to talk about the book a lot of people read the book like please fall off the line if you're not talking about the book tonight we've been talking about this book for months so i want to talk to people who actually took the time out to read the book that's who i want to talk to i want to read what you thought about the book if you have a quote about the book i want to hear it your takeaway about the book i want to know it i don't want to hear tonight your takeaway on reparations we can do that on monday we can have that conversation in. This is not that time. So 216, I'm coming to you. 216, what's your name? Where you calling from? What's on your mind? Hi, this is Lee from Cleveland, Ohio. What's going on? How you doing? Um, let's say my uh, congressperson is Senator, I mean, uh, Congresswoman Marcia Fudd, and she did not sign H.R. 40. However, back to the book. Okay. All right, so what I took away from the book is I had my Plymouth Rock Mayflower Jamestown experience all rolled up in one for what I learned in high school. Okay. So, um, so reading the book taught me, you know, two different incidents, two separate uh, uh, beginnings for America. Uh, one of the characters that I found interesting in the book was Drake. Oh, he I was. I felt like I was watching a scene from um, Pirates of the Caribbean. Mm. How he would go and and um he was taking the uh, he was working with these people the Cimarrones and uh -huh. the Chimones and he was stealing them from the uh, Spanish and Drake was a slave owner himself. However, he was like, "Hey, 
Let me get these people. I'm going to work with these people. And he brought yeah, them to the world. Yeah, no, and the Cameroons, were, really, the Cameroons were black. They were in what really country? Good. What country was that? Barbados? What country was they in? The, the, the black people that Drake worked with? I can't remember off the top of my head. I believe it was the Caribbean. Okay. Yeah. And so um, I, I felt, felt that that was interesting. And then um, uh, I also thought... The England's views on Virginia was interesting as well. They thought that Virginia was just a short-term place. And if you go to page 236, this quote, um, it says, Virginia observed um, a sink to drain England of her filth and scum." Yes, I, I, I highlighted that one. Yeah. I was like, damn. Yeah. And so, in conclusion... Um, what I thought was that the white man is always going to create norms to, to protect him and his mm -hmm. and to always get himself ahead. And when I bring that in today's um, terms, it's what, what happened with Senator Flower and that whole stand your ground um, movement, stand your ground laws. Senator Flower was like, okay, you keep on coming with these laws, we got something for you. <laughs> you know, we're going to fight against you with gun control as well. So, um, that was my takeaway from the book. Thank you so much for everything thank that you. you're doing. Thank you. Like I appreciate our, it. Our modern day Angela Davis. Oh, thank you, thank so you much. fam. I appreciate y'all for reading because ain't nobody. This is a. Let me just say this. Let me just say that. <laughs> Thank you, fam. I appreciate it. Because ain't nobody, ain't nobody, listen, this book, I understand. I Listen, I know how, I know what it took to get through this book. So I appreciate all y'all for showing up and reading this thing because this thing was a beast. Like, it didn't even get to slavery. When I thought, what you gonna get to slavery? You you keep mentioning and saying some stuff and you, oh, you ain't, you, you, you make me so angry. So I, I, I appreciate everybody who stuck with it and, and did the show I mean, and did the book and read the book and and you are now integrating that in your political lexicon and your historical lexicon about what it means to be American in America and, and the America that, that led to who we are here. I appreciate that and I appreciate because y'all could have not been here. Like it's one thing to show me, to, to show up and hear me talk on Mondays and Wednesdays, right? And you know, that's fine. But it's another thing to actually like do the work and read the book and then show up to talk about the book or whatever. That's a different thing. So 267, 267, I'm coming to you. What's your name? Where you calling from? And what's on your mind? Hey, Miss Yvette. What's going on? How you doing? This is the Mile High Prof. Okay. Yeah, this is when I was the, the brother that called the mathematician and talked about Amarosa. And uh, I can tell we, we've come a long way with the book club. And I'm, I'm just so... Uh, elated to know that that's what's going on right now. Thank you so much, Queen. No problem. I appreciate um, it. I have, yeah, I have basically like like a few points I want to talk about like as far as the book is concerned and to see what your take on it is. And those like, and I, and I definitely read the whole book, but there are four things that, that stood out that I thought was pretty interesting. The first was, mm -hmm. you know, the British, they weren't always doing this like separation like race stuff, like um, when they came on the scene in the West, like it points out in the book, because there was a pirate, I guess, that went to Panama that was trying to fight with the Spanish Armada down there, the Spanish fleet, and he managed to link up with some Maroons there, and the Maroons, in defiance, dropped their Catholicism and became Protestants. I thought that was deep. It was all very um, what, and so, Yeah, so, you know, like what we have, like as far as ADOS here in religion, it seems like it's, it's a hard thing for us to, you know, be pulled away from thinking that, like, religion is the one thing that's supposed to hold us together, considering, like, the source that it came from. Uh, but, you know, but, you know, let me just say uh, something. Let me just say one thing. You you see in the, in the latter part of the book, religion served a different purpose. In the latter part of the book, like, you weren't supposed to be a Christian and be enslaved. So some slaves got their freedom by becoming Christian. 
So, so, so some oh, slaves, yeah, that was interesting too in terms of like, like latter years it became like, we're going to use Christianity to kind of keep you oppressed or whatever. But like in the early years it was like, you could become free by being a Christian because there's a contradiction in terms of freedom and what, and so you saw slaves like petition for their freedom. And then like a lot of slaveholders said, we don't want them to learn to be Christians because what happens is they get uppity basically. So it's, it was a very interesting, like could a little conundrum. Right, exactly. Exactly. So it's just they basically just switched the game up this time, moved on. Because Virginia, it seems to me, it was just an experiment to be able to keep sucking wealth out of that colony to get back to the king. Which leads me to like the second to last page of chapter eleven. See, I have a digital copy, so um, my pages aren't going to match up. But it's basically. Uh, the last, the second to last page, last paragraph of chapter 11. Okay. And it reads, the new freedmen were multiplying in numbers every year and unable to afford land elsewhere, moved to the frontiers where they viewed the Indians not as fellow victims, but as rivals for the marginal lands to which both had been driven. They brought their cows and hogs with them. They brought their guns. And they brought a smoldering resentment, which mm. they had been unable to take out on their betters. The Indians, they had been taught, if they needed teaching, were not their betters. Yes, I remember So that. here's my question. Yeah, so here's my question on that. Uh, where does ADOS fit in terms of like a parallel to what's being described right there? I thought that was pretty interesting because mm. it's very clear that the betters uh, was synonymous to like the House of Burgesses. Yeah. And I thought it was interesting because I have the tendency to look at uh, power structures as far as like kings to like the, you know, the, the lords and, and then they send the, you know, the people with the House of Burgesses over. And then the crops that they were making, that they were uh, depending on, sometimes they had bad weather, um, crops been destroyed. And the House of Burgesses, they were keeping a lot of tax money. So once they stopped, like, kicking money that they thought that they would get from uh, a yield of crop, the king notices his pockets getting less fat. Yeah. So what does the king think? He, he says, oh, I think they're working them too hard there. Yeah, he says that. He said that. He says, I think y'all doing too much. I'm not getting my money. Y'all need, need to lay off. Y'all taking too much advantage. Exactly. And look at how the House of Burgesses responded along with uh, the leadership that was there. They went and just started killing people <laughs> to, try to, 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 to try to, like, make up for that move, man. I yeah. just thought that was crazy. And then uh, uh, the last thing I wanted to, to mention is what I thought was very interesting in the book because my slave lineage, it does come from the deep south and, like, Louisiana and Mississippi. And if I'm going to be completely honest, it is from the Caribbean, too. So everything my grandparents told me about my slave lineage it's completely true. Going from uh, Jamaica, Cuba, to Louisiana and Mississippi. So, with that being said, I come from a sugarcane slave family. And what I did not know about, like, the sugarcane folks and why they were so brutal with slavery, not only in the Caribbean, but also in the mainland, is that according to this guy, the material that you needed to like cut down cane and all that stuff was so expensive they were trying to get the maximum return like on their yield so if they were trying to get the maximum return on their yield they used the whip and the last like even more to try to extract that kind of wealth that they could get back from making all of those tools because as you can tell they got artisans from like uh, holland to like build all of those, uh, build all the machinery for us to be able to like uh, uh, work with slaves there, whatever, mm -hmm. to get the work done. Mm -hmm. So they, their you know, reason is that to like whip slaves like so much is basically to make sure you get a return. I just thought that was very interesting. So uh, with all that said, I didn't want to like take up too much of the time. I know I have already. And the last question I have for you is, what do you really think about Bacon's Rebellion being race-based as far as just going after, like, natives 
You know what I think Bacon's Rebellion set the tone because they went after kind of like Native Americans, Indians, right? It's like the scapegoat. But I think I think the lesson I think the lesson in that is that like you need a scapegoat. You it is that it, it, you have to find something that is you that you can otherize for lack of a better word to use as your scapegoat. True. And and like they found at that point Native Americans, but like later on they decided like yeah we're gonna use these Negroes for that. Like I mean the Native Americans they tried to make them slaves too. None of that stuff worked out. It was us. So that's our justice claim. But it's like it's like I think they. I think they figured it out. I think I think they they but they it worked for them, and I think they that kept was, doing it. Like, the, the, go ahead, yeah, man. That was the icing on the cake to finish. The, I'm sorry, that was the icing of the cake to finish the experiment for the black slaves that was soon to come. That they knew were actually living in existence in the northern colonies as well, right? Yeah. 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 So thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Vett. And, no, uh, thank you, give us your take on the House of Burgesses. Thank you so much. I mean, it was that was wild, wasn't it? How the House of Burgesses, like this elite little group, and they kept maneuvering to trying to scavenge you and get stuff for themselves. Like as this elite little House of Burgesses, they kept trying to move and all this stuff and and steal and like. But see, the end at the end of the day, with populism, what happened was they had to give something to the poor people. But you can't give. You can't give. Here's the key. You can't give a whole bunch of stuff to the poor people and stay rich, right? So you have to find a way to move yeah. up a little bit the the, the 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 servant class, but you gotta have a bottom. You gotta have a bottom in terms of how this thing works, in terms of all this capitalism, whatever. So they decided, like at first, well, Native American, we ain't a lot of Native American left. We done killed a bunch of them, ain't nobody. So we're gonna put these 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 slaves on the bottom. So what you really see is the necessity of having a bottom. When the Burgesses couldn't get it from the regular people, they want to be free. They run around here. I don't know what I'm going to do. I can't put them nowhere. They all, oh, they acting up. They want a rebellion. I think what happens is they decide that you have to have a bottom. And like race became the very specific and most efficient way to find a bottom. The creation of race. Because it wasn't really nothing. And I'm a phenotype. Thank you. <laughs> Oh yeah, Drew. Thank you so much, sister. No and problem. Keep fighting. I'm with you all the way. I appreciate you, fam. I appreciate you. And look at what they did, and it's been efficient to this day. It's been efficient all the way from then to now. Ain't that something? Kind of evil, but ain't that something? I'm going to three two one three two one. What's your name? Where you calling from? And what is on your mind? Three two one. What's up, Brett? This is Dion from Orlando. What's going on? Oh, well, after reading this book and looking at the title, I'm like the gentleman from I think it was um, DC area. Uh -huh. I think the, the author, I think the author was trying to to do what a lot of white people do today, where they say that we were slaves too. Uh -huh. In that he he spent so much time in the beginning of the book explaining to us how the different levels of servitude for the white people and how white people were, were servants too. Mm. And I feel like we, it's a mischaracterization of the word slave. Okay. Whereas they were servants who could have the potential to be free. When black people and Indians became servants, they had no, like, there was no time where they could become free. So I feel like the title is a mischaracterization of the word, mm. like, slavery as far as the, as the majority of the book is concerned. Okay. And then another, another thing that I saw in the book, too, was um, when they started making the laws, uh, the miscegenation laws, it's funny how even then the protection of white women as sacred, because it was so few of them, was a specific law where the white woman was protected even then. And so yeah. for me, like, this book just explained to me how white women were even a protected class even then and how... Even though the society was set up in a matriarchal way from from jump, they still protected the women even after our society moved on, like getting later into becoming America. So, you know, those are my two takeaways from the book. Okay. I appreciate it, fam. I appreciate you calling in with your concise and, you know, to the point comments. I appreciate it. We're gonna move we're gonna move to the next one real quick. Seven six three, seven six three, what's your name? Where you calling from? What's on your mind? My name is Cheryl Lynn, and um, I wanted to first say that um, I um, wanted to 
let everybody know if you're like working and you don't have a lot of time, you can go on Audible and get uh, books from your uh, reading list on Goodreads. And, um, you know, you can listen to it. And then I wanted to say that I thank you so much for this wonderful foundation that you've given mm, me. I've been listening you. to you now for about two years. And you really um, helped me to grow in my understanding of why I stay so angry all the time because I'm 63 years old. So it really explains my anger. And um, this book explains how I kind of got here because my grandfather was from Tennessee. And um, he, um, in my Ancestry.com, um, it has Virginia highlighted um, there. So I know that he came from there. And my mom, she came from the cotton fields of Mississippi. And um, was, uh, she worked until I was able to financially sit her down and retire her. So mm. I was very happy that I can, Congratulations. I can do that. No, I said congratulations. You said sit down and retire her. I oh. congratulations. Yeah, thank you. And um, then uh, I was taken away by the constant greed through this book. Everybody was so greedy. Everybody wow. was just uh, they they just they just they just were greedy. Just everybody was greedy, and everybody wanted everything. And then I wanted to speak on how complicit white women were and mm. all of this. Because we're led to believe now that they were at home and they were quiet and they weren't doing anything. And it was the white man that was spreading all the horror. But they were at home teaching the horror to these children. And then they grew, grew up and became the ruthless men that they became. And that's happening even now. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, um, family. Uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute, family. Are yeah. you saying that these white women should have taken responsibility for their little monster children? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. They they taught them racism, then and now. That's what they did. So I, I just found that really interesting. And I learned that they had the financial means because I didn't know that uh, the wealth was passed around the way it was in this book, um, how uh, the white man would die and the white woman would inherit all this wealth and move on from husband to husband. But to isn't husband. that fam? And, let me uh, let me just slow let me just slow you down. I'm not trying to interrupt you. I promise you, I'm not. But you just made a great point. No, that's not. Like, I, I I don't think everybody understood the point that like these white women were outliving their husbands, and so what they were doing was just inheriting as widows and moving on, and like they were the wealth that got passed down. This was family wealth. This was not no kind of like yeah. I'm oppressed. I'm beaten. Like they would decide who they were going to marry. And like and, and people were courting them yeah. because they held this wealth because of, of 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 a husband who had died or two husbands or three husbands depending on depending right. on their life. Like I don't think people really understand that. But let me let you go off head fam. I'm sorry. Oh, no, that's all right. That was the point I wanted to bring out. And then I wanted to let you know, I don't know if you ever heard of him, but this uh, civil rights activist named Ted Hayes, he, he's interested in you. He really speaks highly of you and Antonio's work and wouldn't mind um, having a conversation with you. So I just thought I would pass that on. And then my last point is um, uh, how that right now, they're passing, they're trying to pass a law, I think in California, I may be wrong, I think it's in California uh, for illegal uh, uh, people from the, uh, across the border to be able to vote so the Democrats can replace us in this upcoming We'll see, election. we'll see, fam, so we'll see. That that, all that stuff will be a show. I appreciate you calling in, fam, about that. That was some interesting, interesting stuff to talk about. Um, I'm going to, I'm trying to get as many calls as I can this night. So if, don't feel bad, fam, if I knock you off real quick. I'm just trying to, I know a lot of people read the book and I'm just trying to get as many calls in as I can. I'm going to 516-516. Um, What's your name? Where you calling from? What's on your mind? Hi, Yvette. This is Stacy from Freeport, New York. Thank hey, you Stacey. for taking my call. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Great to talk to you. Um, what I have to say is fantastic book. I was blown That's away good. by the Cimarrons, and they were down in Panama, and then the uh -huh. fact that they were brought here is amazing. 
I was surprised by how little work the Virginia Indians had to do to survive and to thrive. And that work became a form of control of the, um, the indentured servants and then later the slaves and the role of tobacco as currency and how the Dutch were in the Northeast really doing their thing and that's where half of my family comes from and then the other half down Virginia and below. But um, what, how Virginia figures so strong in, um, in framing this country, creating this country, the, the um, people who created the Declaration of Independence, these are all Virginians. And what if the Dutch had been the ones to really create this country? Mm. Would it look and be a different way? Although they had slaves, I know my ancestors were black people, in the Northeast, and some of those black people were free people under the Dutch. Um, mm. And again, the last caller, she got it right. I'm telling you, if white women would stop practicing racism, it would end tomorrow. I know of Ted Hayes as well, but this is a fantastic book about, it really wasn't about, to me, American slavery, American freedom. It could have been called the framers, how we became the United States of America with the uh, plantation holders in Virginia, and what would we be without those Virginia plantation Mm. holders? Mm. Good point, fam. Good point. Nice point. Thanks again. I hope we do it when affirmative action was right or the half has never been I, I think we. I think we probably got to do when affirmative <laughs> action was right first because we, everybody who asked me, just put that on there as the next book and I'll give everybody a date because everybody who asked me about the first book you need to read, that's the book I say. So I think I need to go all the way back to the beginning and do that book. So thank you, fam. I think we're going to do that book first and then we'll do, because we need a lighter, like the, 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 the uh, when affirmative action was white, isn't as long as the half has never been told. So since this book was so thick and so everything, I think it's probably best to do kind of a thinner book. It's a meaty book when affirmative action was white, but let's just lighten the load a little bit. Um, I am going to my last call, 678, 678. I am coming to you. 678, what's your name? Where you calling from? What is on your mind? You there, 678? I think 678 has left us. Then I'm going to do something else. Check the call. 760, you will be my last call. 760, what's on your mind? Hello? Yes, what's going on? Okay, my name is Safra. I'm from Houston. And I just want to get to one part of the book. Okay. I didn't get to finish it, but... It's on um, page 21, and I highlighted, it would be wiser and safer to follow the Spanish practice of alliance with good Indians against bad, such as the advice that the elder Hacklett gave Gilbert. Nothing was more important, he said, than to get on good terms with the Indians of the area where the settlement was made. In this way, the English would learn all their wants, all their strengths, yada, yada, yada. So to me, it just stuck out as like, this is a tactic that they're still using on us. Mm. Like, get get on the good terms of the good Indians, right? Get on the good terms of the good Negroes who are the, what you would call an Uncle Tom or, you know, your um, coon. And they will pull all the other, the bad Negroes, right, the ones that are the rebels, in on our side. And we'll, we'll, mm. we'll get control over the bad Negroes or the bad Indians through the good ones. And that's that's what stood out as significant. Mm, so you th- you you're just saying they're still using that same stuff? Exactly. Okay. All right. All Nothing's right. changed. All right. Thanks. I appreciate you, fam. I want to thank I want to thank you um, for calling. I want to thank everybody who called in for book club night. I appreciate it. Um, I think we kind of clear. I gotta make a date, but I think we kind of clear that when affirmative action was white is gonna be the next the next book club. I think we're kind of straight on that. Um, so, uh, I, people, I, I, I do think when the front, I do think that'll that will be a good way to kind of set the stage for everything that we've talked about. Uh, 
there's so much in that book. Like it's not a really long book. It's not a like it's not a book that's gonna just like hamstring you or handicap you or make you be like, oh my god, it's gonna bed. But it it's meaty. I guess that's the better the best way to say it. Um, so I think that will probably be the next book we read. I will give you a date, um, the next time. And if you didn't finish reading this book, you gotta finish reading it. You can't just be like, well, I didn't get through, I'm gonna throw this book. You gotta finish reading the book. The book is important. The book is important. And the last, if you don't, listen, even if you didn't get all of the front, go out, go to the back and you gotta read the stuff. Like, you gotta read the stuff. Like, we gotta know the stuff because people like to use history as a as a as a bludge or a, a curmudgeon or whatever just to bop us in the head no you got to know your stuff and like we got to be out here knowing our stuff so i want to thank you fam for showing up for book club night i appreciate it um we will do another book soon i appreciate all of those who took the time out to read this very 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 long book um, that didn't spend nearly enough time on slavery, but it gave us a lot of the backdrop for what we needed in terms of the first 1600s and all that stuff. Um, and I appreciate it. So fam, please hit the like button. Please finish your libation. Get ready for going to bed. Um, and I will see you Monday. I want to thank you. Thank you, fam. I appreciate it. Some great callers. It's another great book club. So get some sleep, fam, and we'll talk soon.